session. Um, I can't start this talk without um, uh, mentioning all the people who funded this work, perhaps inadvertently, over the period that I've <laughs> um, been involved in it. And I, as I was going back through it, I realized that it actually included my first employer, postgraduate school, um, Union Carbide Corporation. Um, let me, st um, I've, I've modified the title that Brian suggested to me, but I like it very much. And I will start by explaining a little bit about powder diffraction and indeed why it perhaps is messy from the um, perspective of, um, uh, com in comparison to single crystal measurements. Um, I would like to point out that I love being a powder diffraction crystallographer because, in fact, uh, the, um, it, it's still a sport. The material still has a um, potential for defeating the crystallographer in terms of the um, process of, of determining s structures. Um, for those of you who have not thought about powder diffraction since freshman physics or perhaps even before that, um, I'll remind you that if you have an incident beam on a crystal, if the crystal is oriented properly, it diffracts. If it's not oriented properly, you don't get diffraction. If you have a large number of crystals in the X-ray beam and they are randomly oriented, then you will get diffraction at where those crystals are able to um, do that. Um, one might think that, in fact, when you have an infinite or a near infinite number of crystals in the beam, you will get diffraction in all angles and you'll get no signal out that you care about. But, in fact, you'll only get diffraction at specified rings corresponding to the Bragg angles. So if we take a detector and we sweep it along an angle like so, okay, here's our detector moving, we will see intensity at specific Bragg angles. Okay, and popping up over here, this is a um, relatively simple diffractometer that does that. This is a um, then Siemens D500 diffractometer and that works by moving this detector up along that angle, and here's the x-ray tube right there. Um, if that were all that we needed to worry about, my job would have been a lot simpler and um, would have been forgotten about a long time ago. Um, but um, the problem is that powder diffraction, as I'll explain to you, is collected in a variety of ways. And one of the problems is that we spend a lot of time fighting with that. So we very early on realized that, um, um, actually long before I was even involved in this, it's important to have a universal format for powder diffraction. Why? Well, one reason is that, as I'll show you towards the end of the talk, that graphical examination of the results of the analysis is key to establishing quality. We do not have any metric that um, is that can replace the human eye in terms of the analysis. Uh, every instrument has its own format, and we waste tremendous amounts of time. Um, I would be a, actually a very rich man if I had been paid for every time I got an email message saying, how do I convert data from format X to be used in software Y? <laughs> um, and I think that we are scientists, the process of archive and reproduction of previous work is vital to our field. So back in the um, 19, late 1980s, I volunteered to head up a um, committee through the International Center for Diffraction Data, which despite its spelling is in Newtown, um, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, that's where I started on this. Um, very quickly, what did we want to think about being able to do? Well, we wanted to store powder diffraction data, but we realized that powder diffraction data by itself is meaningless. You need to also keep track of all sorts of metadata. Um, very often the data are not used exactly as, correct, as collected. More often than not, you have to do some sort of reduction you need to calibrate and so on. If you have a material that's at that point unidentified, probably the first thing you will do is reduce it to a table of diffraction peaks so you can work with it more simply. 
You will impose, if you can, a structural model, for example, if you're doing Riedfeld analysis. And um, unlike in single crystal work, the structure factor tables flow from the structural model, not the other way around. So the structure factor tables are actually subjective. The challenge is that there are lots of different ways that powder diffraction are recorded, and I'd like to take you through that a little bit to give you an appreciation of the problem. So let me start by showing you something that's near and dear to my heart. This is the um, powder diffractometer, uh, high resolution powder diffractometer at the APS. Um, and this is a mechanical engineer's conception of what the diffractometer looks like. Large Huber circle on its side, robot, and a detection system which consists of 12 analyzer crystals, perfect analyzer crystals, each with its own um, scintillator data collection. Um, I point out that this is coming from a mechanical engineer because of two things, one of which is that my older son has um, finished a year of mechanical engineering study and plans on making that his career. Also because I want to point out that mechanical engineers don't think about wires. Um, here's what the instrument actually looks like. <laughs> um, so this instrument is producing a series of 12 overlapping diffraction patterns which are collected with these detectors actually slewing to collect the data. Um, I should mention um, that this is now the highest publishing instrument at the, in the physical sciences at the advanced photon source, um, uh, despite being on a bending magnet, which is sort of considered the third rate source at our facility. Um, okay, so that's one type of instrument. Um, a similar type of instrument, despite being at a completely different source, and Brian carefully pointed out laboratory and synchrotron sources, um, in the interests of speaking to the other side, this is from a nuclear reactor. Um, nuclear reactor is over here somewhere, sending a neutron beam, which is diffracted by monochromators in this housing. Sample sits over here. We have 32 detectors sitting around the sample. This whole big um, banana-shaped thing in banana-shaped color um, moves over a 10-degree range, and you collect your da data. Um, and um, so data are collected over the period of sort of an hour to 12 hours, typically. And you now have 32 overlapping scans um, that you need to deal with. And, and um, going to another type of detector, we, here's, this is, I think, the PSI. Um, the Dectris detector is a very popular position-sensitive detector. This gives you data in one dimension. Um, because these detectors will have gaps, you typically, if you want to get a complete diffraction pattern, need to collect the data by moving this to whole detector setup to more than one setting. Another way that's commonly used for collecting diffraction data is with area detection. So here is a sample, um, this picture, which you can't really see the detail of. This is a sample of a, I believe, a um, silicate glass former, which is just below its crystallization temperature, which is why it's glowing red hot. Um, and behind here is a, an area detector. And if we zoom in on the area detector, you can see that it's a grainy sample. These are diffraction from individual crystallites showing up as individual spots. But if you integrate around these rings, you get a fairly good powder diffraction pattern. This is a way that we can currently collect data. Um, typical diffraction pattern is collected in a tenth of a second. Um, and the resolution is nowhere near the high resolution instruments that I showed you in the, be in the beginning, either neutron or, or, or x-ray. But the ability to collect a diffraction pattern as you modify your sample in some process, um, you can collect tremendous amounts of data on the fly. So um, this is yet another way that we can collect powder diffraction data. And last and probably most complicated is to use a time of flight neutron source. In this source, periodically on, on, on tenths of hertz type time scale, you'll send protons into a heavy metal target, produces a cascade of neutrons, which are slowed down by a moderator. So you can imagine we have neutrons coming out of this source 
of various colors in bursts. Um, by the de Broglie equation um, for neutrons, energy turns into speed. So by the time the neutrons get down to here, at where a sample is, they've separate, separated out in time. So we have the, um, the most energetic neutrons arriving first and the um, least energetic neutrons arriving somewhat later. If we look at, at a fixed detect detector angle, we will see that some of these neutrons will have the right energy to diffract. If we look at another place, we'll see diffraction of different neutrons. So in this experiment, um, you tile as much of four pi steradians as you can afford, and you collect these neutrons in a, as a function of both angle and time. So these days we have neutron we have older instruments that collect discrete time of flight patterns, but we're heading towards um, instruments which are highly pixelated, and in some of these instruments um, we actually don't collect the intensity versus pixelation, we actually just collect events. So every event that comes in, we record where it occurred, where it was detected, and what the timestamps for it are. So going back to thinking about what the data requirements are to capture this kind of raw data, in the simplest case, we'll have counts or intensity. And I'm not going to spend too much time thinking about the difference between that, but of course, intensity is we don't, can't take the um, Poisson statistics or, to, or, or square root to understand the uncertainties versus angle. Um, but we may have either fixed wavelength or variable wavelength in the time of flight case. We may have counts versus time of flight at fixed angle. We may have counts versus or intensity versus pixel. Sometimes we have intensity, pixel versus time of flight. And we may have, so we may have 2D data sets or three-dimensional data sets. We don't typically work with things as complicated as that. We reduce the data. We apply corrections for various effects. And we may have, we usually will end up with one-dimensional Q versus intensity versus Q in some fashion. But we may be collecting data versus some other variable, such as temperature, pressure, azimuth, um, maybe even a combination of these things. I'd also like to remind you, um, particularly speaking to this audience, that the purpose of doing all of this is not only to study crystal structure, but we do this in some cases to identify materials or quantify what phases are present. Um, when one software package I've been involved with for quite a few years, GSAS, implemented nine, being able to quantify nine phases in a material, my assumption was that was easily good for a century. Um, we're finding problems with uh, people who are um, studying cement clinker who would like to go up to perhaps 20 or 30 components in their materials and quantify it. And with um, synchrotron data collection, we can easily quantify materials at the level of a tenth of a percent without doing anything terribly heroic. Texture, texture is the orientation of the crystallites. That's what gives the um, Coca-Cola can the strength to stand up to one of my children shaking it without exploding. Um, residual stress or applied stress is something that's very important for those of us who do, would prefer that airplane wings don't crack and fall off. Um, we're also very interested, particularly in these days of nanomaterials, in things like what are the crystallite sizes. So these are all kinds of studies that um, people are interested in, in performing with powder diffraction, and we want to capture in um, a file. So let me tell you quickly about the um, progress or, there, or, 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 or lack thereof with powder diffraction SIF. As I mentioned initially, we started with, the, um, with, with an effort from the International Center for Diffraction Data, and we went um, looking at a spectroscopic format called JCAMP-DX. 
we completed a JCAMP DX format when um, Sid Hall came and spoke to me and presented to me this brand new SIF format and suggested that I drop everything that I'd already done um, and start again. Um, Sid is very persuasive. <laughs> um, I'll leave it at that. He was, but it was, he was right. Um, so stage zero was negative progress. Stage one was um, to um, create a, di a data dictionary. And it took quite a few years to get the ICDD actually to follow and with, with it adopting this dictionary. Um, the, we advanced from useless to write only, which may be another way of saying useless, um, with a prototype export program. Um, and during that period, I'm pleased to say that in 1995, as best as I can tell, the first powder diffraction data set was sent in to a journal. I have no idea what happened to that. It might be actually on the web for all I know. Um, describing a crystal structure. Um, a little bit later on, we developed a, actually I should say I, developed a first reading program that would actually take the data out. At this point, we do have some software that reads powder diffraction SIFs, but I think that we're really reaching a stage where we can look forward to PDCIF finally, after two decades, starting to see routine use. So um, the ICDD has released a data deposition application that people can um, put onto their own computers to prepare data files for their deposition process. And that actually assembles, if, even if you don't, if you don't have it, a PDCIF and sends it off to them for analysis. I wish I remembered the name that they released this program on, but I love the name that it was used for development, which was called the Data Quacker. Um, and I think that, and, and I'll spend some time talking about what I consider to be a really brilliant move forward that's coming from the, ICD, the IUCR journals um, by integrating the um, PDCIF into the publication process. Okay. So what are some of the reasons that PDCIF is complicated? Well, for one thing, we often have to deal with the issue, as I mentioned, that there are multiple crystallographic phases in a single diffraction data set. Um, somewhat less common, but still important, is that people often will collect different diffraction data sets to study a single problem. Perhaps multiple temperatures, also, quite possibly, collecting both an X-ray data set and a neutron data set, sometimes even a um, X-ray single crystal data set and a neutron powder data set. Um, so SIF or SIF-1 does not allow multiple definitions of core items. So for example, if you want to specify two lattice sets of lattice constants, because you have two different unit cells, you need to put that in different blocks. Um, if you have the simplest case, one data set, one phase, you can do it all in one SIF block. But if the number of data sets or the number of phases is greater than one, then you're going to have to have more than one SIF block. And I won't talk about this, but my opinion is that it's best to have one more than the number of data sets plus the number of phases. But these things are interrelated, so PDCIF uses block pointers to explain to the reading individual or software, um, how the um, um, data sets are interrelated. Um, because data can go into this format in a number of different um, uh, ways, we have a lot of different data items that one may have to read from in order to find the powder diffraction data in the file. OK, so where are we now? Well. The IUCR has developed something which I'll show you a little bit about. Um, I'm not quite at 20 minutes according to um, my clock over here, James. Um, let's see. The ICDD, as I told you about, has embraced this. Um, but I will have to say that, um, the, as I've got up here, the IUCR is finding that there's a lot of variable quality in the PD SIFs that are making it to Chester. Um, and that's a significant problem. Um, the 
I, I'm really very impressed. I would have liked to give you an online demo, but I don't, dare not. Um, if you go to um, the current issue of the Journal of Applied Crystallography, um, the, um, you'll see that there's a new button here, powder diffraction data. If you click on that, on that button, you will bring up, in this case, another page where you can um, see a plot button over there. And if you click on that, it bring, transfers the diffraction data over to your computer where you can see a live plot of this data. You can zoom in on that. So here's his, we're zooming in on it. This, by zooming in, exposes a problem with these data right here. Um, that in, the lack of intensity there is, 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 is an issue. Another nice feature of this is that over here you will see that there's this little cryptic button there which allows you to download the pattern in a publication quality format. This is zooming in on that little corner there, so I don't think too many journals will have problems publishing a figure of that quality. So I think that this will actually provide quite a bit of utility to the um, powder user, and I'm hopeful that this is going to help bring us forward So in some, with, to bring you some conclusions. The community stands clearly to benefit from adoption of PDCIF. But it's not going to happen without the interests of the producer of the data. Um, you, to adopt any standard, um, I feel that the standard needs to be well designed and it must fill a need. You must have good software to sm smooth the use of the software and the user must gain something from adoption of the standard. I think we've, uh, the user now will gain something, particularly with this recent um, uh, uh, work from, from, um, from Chester. The standard, I, th I believe, is well designed and fills a need, and this is the real place where we need to work on improving the quality of the software. And that's what I have.